And so we ought to praise God for that. And so thank you for singing and praising the Lord with us today. It's been a delight just to sing these wonderful songs with you and, and uh, lift our voices to heaven. And uh, you know what? I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ in 1991, and the promise is I'm going to live forever. And I hope that's your story as well. And it doesn't have to be 1991. Maybe it could be today. Today could be the day of your salvation. Father, thank you for the privilege that we have today to come together, sing praises to you, uh, to lift our voices in appreciation to you because of what you have accomplished through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we know what we deserve. We know what we, we, know what we owe you. But because of the grace that you've lavished on us through the shed blood of Jesus, we can know that we have eternal life. And so, Father, I pray today that as we look into the text of Scripture and as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, that you would open our hearts and open our minds. I have nothing of value to say. It's what your word says, that is, where the power is. And so I pray that your word would go forth powerly, powerfully among us and that your word would pierce our hearts. And if we are believers, Father, that we would, we would be purposed to live our lives in a way that's pleasing to you. And if we are not believers in Christ today, may today be the day of our salvation. So, Father, do a work, a work only that you can do through the power of your Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray this. Amen. At the heart of Christianity is the claim that a dead man rose back to life. I mean, that's absolutely ludicrous. It's ridiculous. I've been to many funerals over the course of my life. I've performed many funerals over the course of my ministry. And, and I have approached many corpses dur during those funerals. And, and to date, to date, none of them woke up. In fact, I might have died if one of them did wake up. The thought of a man being raised from the dead is foolishness to the highest order. Or is it? What if it were true? What, what if there was a man who actually beat death? What, what if there was a man who beat death and, and the same man made it possible for you to beat death, eternal death, as well? What, what, if, what if you could know today that because of this man's death and resurrection, you could be assured of eternal life? You know, the young, when we're young, we get skeptical about these things, but the older we get, the older we get, we have a pull, we have a, we have a sense of our mortality, and we start to ask the question, what's going on behind the curtain? What happens after I take my last breath here? Those questions start to become more and more serious when we're faced with our mortality. And so really this leads in to the main thought that I want to share with you this morning. Jesus was raised from the dead, just as he said. But the question is, do you believe? Do you believe? There are three actions I want you to, that I want you to see that the disciples take in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12 that Lauren read to us, but I'm going to review with you this morning. And the first is this, a walk of unbelief. There's a walk of of unbelief. Look at verses 1 through 5. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living? among the dead. It was early Sunday morning, the first day of the week, and, and they, the ladies, mentioned in Luke 23, 55, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women, walked to the tomb, and their walk was one of unbelief. I would submit that to you this morning. Their walk was a walk of unbelief. And you may ask the question, how do, you, how do you know they were walking in unbelief? Well, I can, because we can tell they were going to finish the embalming process that they were not able to finish on Friday because the Sabbath was upon them. Look at Luke chapter 23, verses 53 through 56. It says this, Then he took it down and wrapped, took it, the body, down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb, 
cut in stone where no one had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with them from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned to prepare spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day, they rested according to the commandment. So they prepared, but they weren't able to implement and apply those spices. So what does their action of walking with these embalming spices show us? What, what did these ladies believe? They believed that Jesus was dead. They believed that he was still in the tomb. They were walking in unbelief. But when they arrived at the borrowed tomb where Jesus was laid, what did they find? Well, they found that the stone was moved. Now, how big was this stone? Uh, no wounded, no crucified man had the wherewithal, especially what Jesus went through as you read the accounts. No man like Jesus in his state would have been able or have the wherewithal to move such a weight. The entrance, listen to this, I think this is interesting, the entrance of a Jewish tomb was quite small. So the stone needed to cover the, cover the opening that would only be about four to six feet in diameter and approximately one foot thick. How much would a stone weigh that size? Depending on the type of stone used, it could weigh between one to two tons, 2,000 to 4,000 pounds. This is quite heavy, but two men could move it into place. Uh, the more difficult task, however, was removing it, moving the stone out of the way. Generally speaking, the rolling stone was set on a groove, inside a groove in front of the entrance of the, of, of the secure, and it was secured from falling over by a stone uh, wall that stood in front of the tomb. You can see that on the picture there. Okay, But often the groove was not level, so the groove that the stone was in was not level, and, and that was by design, so the stone would stay in place. To roll it up, they were actually rolling it uphill in order to open the stone. So it wasn't just simply moving the stone out of the way, they would have to roll it uphill to get it out of the way. So the stone, when they arrived, was, was rolled away from the tomb, and there was no logical reason from their perspective why this should be the case. I don't know about you, but, but if I were with these ladies and we came up to, the, up to that tomb and, and, and that was supposed to be closed, in fact, sealed, as the text tells us, and it was open, I'm the kind of guy that's going to go in and take a look. And maybe you would too. And that's exactly what they did. They climbed into the tomb only to find that tomb empty. How could this be? Did somebody steal the body? That was certainly an accusation that ended up going around, that the body was stolen. But that makes no sense. Reverend Gary Jensen says this. He says, Neither the Jewish nor Roman leaders who guarded the tomb would have taken the body. Rather, both had every motive to produce the body publicly in order to humiliate the disciples and nip their movement in the bud. And since this scene in question was right at Jerusalem, it was completely within their power to locate the corpse should it have still existed. Yet to, this, to their dismay, no such body was ever produced. Listen, if the Jews had the body, they would have wheeled it into the day of Pentecost when all of Jerusalem was in an uproar because of Peter's sermon on the resurrection of Christ. If they could have produced the body, they would have produced the body. If they could have stolen the body, they would have stolen the body. They didn't. Stealing the body is a seemingly logical explanation for one with a heart of unbelief, but there is a better explanation, an explanation that's given in verses 4 and 5. Look at the text. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, and the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? What, what, what a puzzling, what, what a confusing event for these ladies to experience. By the way, I love the fact that it was ladies that first got to experience this, that they were the ones that got to experience the resurrected Christ first. And by the way, back in that day, that would have no credibility in a court of law. Women had no credibility. And I love the fact that it was women that were the first ones there to see that and actually lends credibility to the validity of the scriptures because the scriptures say it like it is that there was women there seeing these seeing this amazing event 
And there was these two men in dazzling apparel. Well, who were these men? Well, they were angels of God, of course. Angels tend to show up throughout the scriptures when God is about to do something amazing. Have you noticed that as you read the, read the scriptures? Two angels showed up to save Lot before Sodom was destroyed in Genesis 19. Two angels showed up to Abraham and Sarah to let them know they were about to have a baby in their old age in Genesis 18. Uh, they showed up to inform Samson's parents about their baby in Judges 13. And the angel Gabriel, of course, announced the birth of Jesus. That's what an angel does. They're a messenger. And here are two angels to announce the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection is a big deal, folks. It's a big deal. Check out John chapter 20, verse 12. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. Look again at verse 5. And they were frightened, and they bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? It's a great question for us to grapple with. So from perplexed to frightened, listen, if an angel, and you have to understand this, if an angel were to show up here right now in all of his glory, you and I would be absolutely on our face in terror. Absolutely. In fact, we see the Apostle John in the, uh, in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. He falls down at the feet of an angel and begins to worship that angel because he thinks that angel is someone to be worshipped. And what does that angel tell him? Knock it off. Do not worship me. There's only one who deserves worship, and it's certainly not me, an angel. It's God alone. But man, if an angel were to show up here, we would be strongly tempted to fall on our faces. So, the angel's question to these women was a powerful one, one so powerful that it challenged their thinking, why do you seek the living among the dead? They must have been confused about what the angels had just said. After all, they were not looking for the living, were they? They were walking a walk of unbelief. They, they were looking for the dead. They were looking for the dead Jesus, but he wasn't dead. He was alive. And they should have known that Jesus would beat death. They should have known that the grave would not hold the Messiah if he were truly the Messiah based on his testimony alone. Look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. This was not like a secret that Jesus had. Over and over again, he's telling his disciples, hey guys, just so you know, I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to raise from the dead. I don't know if they were deaf. I don't know if they were dumb. I mean dumb this way, not this way. But they didn't catch it. They didn't understand it. It was a surprise to them. Mark chapter 8, verse 31 says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man, that's what he called himself, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. Luke, two, Luke 9, 22, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and re be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day raised again. This was not a secret. Jesus wasn't holding this close to his chest, especially near the end of his ministry. Over and over, Jesus told his disciples that he was going to die and that he was going to rise again. And each time, it was met with unbelief. And even on their walk to the grave that morning, these ladies were not seeking the living among the dead. They were simply seeking the dead. God had important news for these ladies. So important that he dispatched two messengers to give them the glorious news. Now, when our daughter, Alexandra, our oldest daughter, was a little girl, we had to be so careful with her because if we told her that we were going to do something on a particular day, you better believe she would not forget that. And so we had to get to the place where we were, Angie and I were negotiating, okay, we, well, okay, we might do this today. We perhaps we'll do this if we have. So we had all these caveats that we had to put into our language with our daughter because she was such a literalist. She was such someone who just held our feet to the fire with our word. We couldn't get away with anything around her. She never forgot and believed every word we said. The disciples, these ladies, did not have that problem. They did not have that problem. They failed to believe what Jesus said about his own resurrection. 
Folks, the resurrection of the Messiah should not have been a surprise to the disciples. Certainly, the Old Testament scriptures over and over again predict it. In Psalm 16, as one example, verse 10, it says, For you will not abandon my soul. This is a messianic prophecy. Well, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or Gehenna or hell or the underworld or let your Holy One see corruption. And Jesus spoke over and over again about it. Yet they walked in unbelief. What about you this morning? What about you? Are you walking in unbelief when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Listen, if this whole Jesus thing is simply a figment of our imagination and we're just deluded, then it's really no big deal. No big deal. No harm, no foul. We get together, we sing some songs, we're all deluded. Great. You know, we're just happy in our delusion. Right? But if Jesus is real, if his life was real, if his death was real, and his resurrection was real, then we have been afforded the best news that we could ever imagine. Do you walk your life in a walk of unbelief? I hope you don't. I hope that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only believe that he was born and he lived and walked this life, but he died a criminal's death and he hung on a cross, paying for your sin debt, and then rose again from the grave, thus providing you a means to eternal life. Jesus was raised from the dead, just as he said. The big question is, do you believe it? So we talk about a walk of unbelief, but number two, a run of remembrance. There's a run of remembrance. Look at verses 6 through 9. He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And remember his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to eleven and to all the rest. Well, the, the angels had some very important news, the, the good news that they gave them, right? And, and, uh, and the angels declared the most monumental news ever spoken, I would argue. Jesus Christ is alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. The angels then remind them what the Lord told them in verse 7. A and, and this is the gospel. This is, what, this is what Paul declares in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Paul writes this. He says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain, for I deliver to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the gospel message. That's how we're saved. If we believe this, we unpack that, we understand it, but you have to subscribe to this in order to be right with God. I know you know this. The news is incessant. It's constant. We're always being inundated with the news. All the major networks, the newspapers and the websites are, are, giving, are given to tell us the latest and the greatest juicy tidbits. But my friends, there is no greater news than what these angels told these women some 2,000 years ago. The message of the gospel is this, that the God-man came into this world to die in your place so you would not have to be separated from him in hell for all of eternity. He came to give you eternal life. And that eternal life is obtained by believing that the Lord is the God-man. The Lord Jesus Christ is the God-man. And, and, and his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection from the dead is sufficient to save you. You see, God poured his wrath upon the Son. We talked about that Friday night. God dumped his wrath on the Son as the satisfaction or the substitutionary atonement for your sin. He stood in your place. He hung on that cross that you deserve, that you should have hung on, and he hung on it for you. He died, and then... To top it all off, he didn't stay dead. Praise the Lord. You can be saved today. You can pray to ask God to forgive you of your sins. 
God is not some cosmic ogre. For God so loved, we just sang that, right? For God so loved you that if you believe in him, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. He's talking about eternal life here. You might think, oh, I'm too bad for him to save me. I've done too much. You have no idea what I've done. I, 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 he would never want to save me. No, no. Get that out of your head. Even the criminal that hung next to him on, the, on his own cross, next to him, believed in Jesus and said, and Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. That guy did, never was baptized. That guy never went to church. That guy never gave any money. That guy never did anything. What did he do? He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what was the promise? That today you will be with me in paradise. What a beautiful promise. What a beautiful promise. On the other hand, you might think that you aren't that bad at all. I'm not so bad. In fact, God would be really privileged to have me on his team. Right? Maybe that's, maybe that's where you're at, just being honest. And, uh, and God will let you into heaven because you're, you're a pretty good person. You're, you do pretty good stuff. And, you know, I mean, you give money to church or you give money to organizations and you're just a fine philanthropist or you walk little old ladies across the street or you, you're just a great neighbor. I mean, you just you show up to work all the time. You're just perfect. You know, I mean, if we're going to be honest, in your mind, you're just about perfect, Right? Well, entrance into heaven isn't gained by those works. It's not how you get into heaven. The key of good works will not unlock the door of heaven. If you could earn your way to heaven, there would have been no need for Jesus Christ to hang on the cross. There would have been no need for God to send his only son to suffer such an ignominious death on your behalf. There would be no need for that. So what's the point, right? Good works, doing good things will not earn your way into heaven. Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 6 says this, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The only way you will ever get into heaven after you die is if you believe that Jesus is the only way into heaven. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, see that? No one comes to the Father except through me, Christ. Not through Buddha, not through Muhammad. Not through any other means, not through your good works. It's through Christ and Christ alone. Christ willingly went to the cross to pay for your sins, to pay a debt you could never hope to pay. Someone has to pay your sins, and Christ did. Think, think of the sin uh, of uh, think of sin as like breaking the law. And when you break the law, you are caught and you have to pay the price. Right? If you're speeding in your car and the police officer pulls you over, he or she is obligated to give you a ticket. My brother-in-law is here. Sometimes he had grace on people. And, but, 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 but as a police officer, you're, it's your job, right? You, you have to give a ticket, a punishment, if you will, for breaking the law. This is how a just society works. It has to work this way. It has to be a society of laws, otherwise the society will fall apart. The same is true in the spiritual realm. God has his holy laws, the top ten we call them, right? The Ten Commandments, his, his laws. And when we break them, we have to pay the price. Everyone has broken them over and over, myself included. There's no judgment coming from me, folks. I would echo the words of the Apostle Paul, I'm the chief of sinners. I have not walked this life sinlessly by any means, but I praise God for his mercy and for his grace. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And payment for breaking God's law is death, eternal death or separation from God in hell. And this is really bad news. And I know we don't like to use the word hell. I understand that. It's not politically correct, and, and I should be nicer about it. But I, I'm trying to be a friend because faithful are the wounds of a friend. 
And if I were if I were just up if I were a doctor and you had cancer, let's say you had cancer, and you you uh, you came to me and I just you're my friend and I don't want to hurt your feelings, so um, I ran all the tests. You come in and say, I say, oh Vicky, uh, you're fine. You know, just just take some more vitamins. You'll be fine. What kind of a doctor am I? I'm a terrible doctor, right? I'm more, I'm, more, I'm more concerned about me than I am about her. But if I love her and I'm a doctor that loves her, I'm going to say, Vicki, you have cancer and this is the treatment plan you need to take and we need to get at this right away. As your pastor, because I love you, I have to tell you that if you are not in Christ, you are facing an eternal separation from God. And it is my earnest desire that you trust Christ today so that you can have the hope of eternal life in heaven. I didn't write this stuff, folks. And if I were, if I were all about being popular, I wouldn't be talking about this stuff. But I love you. And I want you to know that you can have eternal life. That's my heart for you. There is really good news available for us. The same God that promises to punish lawbreakers, at the same time, he loves you and doesn't want you to pay for your lawbreaking. So he sent his sinless son of God to offer his life in your place. That's what Romans 5.8 says. For God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners. Don't you love this? He didn't wait for you to clean up. He didn't wait for you to get it right. Because guess what? You can't and you won't. He didn't wait for that. While you were still sinners, Christ died for us. God the Father promises to accept what God the Son, Jesus, did on the cross as a payment. Payment enough to cover all of your sins, past, present, and future. Okay, all right. Thank you, Dennis. Now let's all do what Dennis just did. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ramp back at this again. No, 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 not yet, not yet. I'm setting this up, okay? All right. So God the Father promises to accept what God the Son, Jesus, did on the cross as payment to cover your sins, past, present, future. Yeah, praise the Lord. Praise God. And that's absolutely astounding. His life for yours. His life for yours. All you need to do is repent of your sin and accept the free gift of eternal life by faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John MacArthur said this, I think is really good. Christ was not a mere victim of unjust men when he hung on the cross. It was the greatest sacrifice ever made, the purest act of love ever carried out, and ultimately and infinitely a higher act of divine justice than all the human injustice it represented. This is what the angels meant when they said that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and rise on the third day. Verses 8 and 9. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the, the ladies then remembered what Jesus had told them, and they rushed back. They rushed back to the apostles to give them this amazing news. Uh, the way Luke writes about it, uh, it's, it, they, it, it seems so subdued, the way Luke pens this. But, but you know, the fact they were bursting with joy at the prospect that their Lord had been raised from the dead. In fact, Matthew captures more of this attitude in Matthew 28, 8. It says, so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to the disciples. They were running. They're excited about this. These women had told, been told by the angels the most significant news ever to be spoken that Jesus had been risen from the dead. Everything that he, Jesus, had told them had come true, and now they are sprinting back to the apostles who are hiding in the upper room to tell them this amazing news. I heard about a lady recently winning the lottery. She wanted to remain anonymous right? And for good reason. I don't, I don't really blame her. But, but frankly, I wouldn't be able to keep my mouth shut if I won the lottery. First of all, I'd probably, I'd probably get in trouble with the elders. But, but, uh, but I wouldn't be able to keep my mouth shut 
if I won the lottery, I'd tell everybody, and I'd probably give half of it away before the week was over. I'd pay off this building, and, and uh, man, it'd be, it'd be great. And so it's probably good I don't play the lottery. But these ladies, these ladies could not keep their mouth shut once they really apprehended what happened. They remembered the words of Jesus, and it motivated them to go and tell the apostles this amazing thing that had just happened. For the Christian here this morning, I have a question for you. If you're born again, if you're in Christ, you're a legitimate follower of Jesus, I have a question for you. How does your life reflect that you know the good news? How, how do, what, what, what does your life look like in light of the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead? Do you live like you have forgotten the words of Jesus, much like the ladies did? Or do you live your life exuding the reality of the resurrection? Frankly, I honestly, I struggle at times with apathy about the resurrection more than I do having the attitude of running to tell others what I remember about Jesus. I want to challenge all of us believers here today. Let's have, let's have the second chapter of attitude that the ladies had, where we're running to people. We're unashamedly saying, He is risen. He is risen indeed. And, and be able to tell people about that. So many people, so often, so all over the place, online or in person, have no problem sharing with you what they think about life. Did you notice that? And then we Christians were like, oh, goodness, if I say something, then um, they might not like me, and then I won't have them as friends anymore, and, uh, oh, I just can't, I can't stand that thought. We need to repent of that because faithful are the wounds of a friend, because we want them to know Jesus, because if the gospel is true, there's no better news to share we have a glorious privilege to regularly remember and run to others with, them, with the amazing news that they can have the guarantee of a right relationship with God and eternal life. And so I say, let's be at that business, Christian. Let's be at that business. And to the unbeliever here this morning, I have one sentence for you. And I say this with love and not with judgment. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Right where you're sitting. You don't have to do anything. It's all done for you. In your heart of hearts, pray. Confess your sin to him. Even now, while you're sitting here, confess your sin to him. And the promise is, he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Right here, right now. Wouldn't that be an amazing resurrection day? If you were resurrected unto new life. So, Jesus was raised from the dead, just as he said. The question is, do you believe? So we see a walk of remembrance, a walk of unbelief, a run of remembrance, and then lastly, a story of utter nonsense. A story of utter nonsense. Look at, look at Luke 24, 10 through 12. Now it was Mary Magdalene and jo uh, Joanna, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But the words seemed to them as an idle tale, and they did not believe them. What? Seriously? But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping to look in, and he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. So they ran to the apostles. They told them this amazing news that was corroborated by the heavenly messengers. Surely the apostles, surely the apostles would listen to these women. But as you can tell from the text, this was not the case. It was not the case. The apostles' astonishing response was they didn't believe. These 12 men who were personally called by Jesus to learn from him, their Messiah, the one who promised them that he would rise from the dead, over and over again he promised this, did not believe the women's testimony. They thought, the text says, they, this is, it was an idle tale. The Greek word here means it's speech which is complete and utter nonsense. They thought what he, they were saying was complete and utter nonsense. Humbug. Pure nonsense. That's the spirit that the apostles had with these women. The NIV tra uh, translates this phrase, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed like them to be nonsense. Can you believe 
that it was the apostles who did not believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? If anyone should have expected this, you would think they would have been sitting outside the tomb saying, whoa, what? when's he going to come out? He's got, well, it's got to happen sometime here. It's going to happen. They should have been waiting right there. But they missed it. Well, there were two that had enough curiosity to at least go back and check out the story. We see that at Peter in Luke 24, 12, says he went and did that. And John mentions this, that he went, they went, both John and he ran to the tomb. You can see that in John 20, verses 3 through 6. They, they at least, James, or Peter and John at least went to check it out. And I don't think, I don't think they, they ran in total faith. They, they ran in skepticism to see if these things were so. Peter saw the proof of an empty tomb, yet he still struggled to believe. John's gospel says in verse 9, For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. I feel kind of good about that because I'm pretty thick. Sometimes my wife has to beat me upside the head with a two-by-four, not literally, metaphorically, before I really truly understand something. So I have a little bit of grace with these guys, but come on. They, they still didn't get it. They still didn't understand. And it's easy for us to look our, down our nose in judgment against these disciples because they didn't believe the words of Jesus. But we shouldn't. We really shouldn't. They had just witnessed the brutal killing of their rabbi. We can't even understand fully what, what happened, what emotionally was going on. He was beaten beyond recognition and then crucified. And because they were associated with him, their lives were in danger. They were hiding in the upper room, not sure what to do or not sure what was next. And I think probably, if I'm going to be honest, I would have been standing right there with him. And the thought of Jesus being raised from the dead after all they had been through from their perspective was nonsense. It was just nonsense. But it wasn't. It wasn't nonsense. It was gospel truth. Look at Acts 1.3. He presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many, many proofs, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Not only could they not produce a dead body, but Jesus himself walked around alive for 40 days, having sandwiches with people, having fish fries with people, talking with people, ministering to people. 500 witnesses. To Jesus walking around. Lee Strobel put it like this. He said, if, I were, if we were holding a trial to determine the facts concerning the resurrection, and, and if we were to call, the witness stand, uh, to call to the witness stand every witness who personally encountered the resurrected Jesus, and we cross-examined them for only 15 minutes, and if we went around the clock without a break, we would listen, we would be listening to firsthand testimony for more than 128 hours. That's five days worth of testimony without a break. Who could possibly walk away unconvinced? He goes on to stay, say the stories, they are too close. The, the written history is too strong to deny what they saw and what they experienced. One psychologist even said, quote, over 500 people having the same hallucination would be more of a miracle than the resurrection itself. Jesus was raised from the dead, just as he said. The big question for you this morning is, do you believe? We see a walk of unbelief, a a run of remembrance, and then the idea of a story that is utter nonsense. But it's not. Jesus rose from the dead just as he said he would. 500 witnesses of Jesus walking and talking among them for 40 days after the resurrection. The whole of the New Testament is a is historically the, the New Testament is a historically reliable document. And this, this, this historically reliable document attests and proclaims this very fact. So the title of this message is, So What? Jesus raised, was raised from the dead. So what? Big deal. Who cares that Jesus was raised from the dead? What's the big deal about this anyway? Well, Paul answers that in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17. A passage I've already read to you, but I want to read one more time. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. 
and you are still in your sins, then those who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, have perished. They're dead. It's meaningless. If Christ, if in Christ we have hoped in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep for as by a man came death, by a man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, because of our great, 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 great grandfather Adam and their sin, we all have inherited death. So for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all made to be alive. In a very short period, the disciples did come to believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And it was the single most galvanizing truth behind their faith in Christ. All of the disciples, all of them, except John, were martyred for their belief in Christ and his resurrection. It should. It, it, so what's the big deal? The big deal is these guys were willing to die for this truth that Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead. Charles Coulson, perhaps you've seen this before, I think it's really wonderful. Charles Coulson served as special counsel to President Nixon from 1969 to 1973. And he said this after the Watergate incident, after he was arrested. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact. And Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. He goes on to say, you're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. So the title, as I said, of this sermon is, He Has Risen. So what? So what? Ladies and gentlemen, if you do not believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, you have no hope of eternal life. His resurrection is that important. So, do you believe Thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to come together on this Resurrection Sunday. Lord, we thank you that Jesus Christ did not stay in the grave, but that he was resurrected unto life. Uh, and Lord, because he was the first fruits of resurrection, we who are in Christ have the very same promise that we will enjoy eternal life forever and ever and ever. So, Father, if there is one, just even one here that does not know you as Savior, I pray, Lord, that even in their seat right now, they would repent of their sins and place their faith in their only hope, Jesus Christ. And, Father, for those of us that are Christians, help us to be not be like the timid apostles that are hiding out in the upper room or the unbelieving women who walked a walk of unbelief. But, Father, help us to be bold like the apostles when they came to believe and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they, they turned this world upside down. God, forgive us of our apathy. And may we as a church... Turn Allendale upside down with the gospel. Turn this state upside down with the gospel. Turn this world upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.